Hey, what's up? How's it going? If you found this video, then you're probably like me. Capcom has a stranglehold on your wallet every time that they pump out one of these games, and now you're trapped writing about it, and you sleep under your desk now. Oh, what game am I talking about? Huh, it's Monster Hunter, baby. A game series with a simple premise. Hunt monsters and assemble their flesh in a fashionable arrangement so that you can continue the cycle of exterminating an entire quadrant of the animal kingdom all by yourself. It's a simple concept, but it's something that I would say consistently delivers hours of fun for the player base. What's even more astounding is that as the console generations continued to progress, the games continued to improve, which got me thinking. When compared to the games industry as a whole, why do I feel more confident in my purchasing decision of a Monster Hunter game over 90% of the games that are supposed to release in any given year? I mean, I can tell you right now, if Capcom told me they were releasing Monster Hunter 6 next week, I'd put $60 down, no questions asked. But why? What is the secret sauce that makes these games so good? Is it the combat? Is it the music? Is it the story? <laughs> no. Let's be serious, nobody plays these games for the story. But seriously, the world needs to know why this game has a triangle choke around my credit card. So, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and walk with me as we go on this journey and unpack the Monster Hunter formula. And also hopefully figure out what secret ritual Capcom is performing to consistently take all of my money. Before we dive into the specific tactics Capcom deploys when developing a Monster Hunter game, I think it's best that we do some level setting on the goals of the games industry as a whole. After all, how can anything be great if we have nothing that is bad to compare it to? I want to frame up a question to make sure that we can make that comparison. Specifically, I want to answer the question, what is the goal of a games company? The hopeless romantic in me really wants the answer to be to make timeless pieces of art. Games like The Binding of Isaac or Hollow Knight or Bastion or Super Meat Boy. But the sad reality is that a development company's primary goal is not to make art. It's to make money. Now, don't get me wrong, without an artistic vision, some of the games that I listed above would have never gotten off the ground. Without the gorgeous Disney era animation, Cuphead is just another bullet hell, and without the specific combination of meat and boy, Super Meat Boy is just another puzzle platformer. So, a good mind for art can elevate a game. But the reason companies want a game to elevate at all is so that they can sell more of their game. By selling more of their game, the company can make the studio more profitable to make even more games and make even more money until you have so much money that you can finally achieve your dream of still being unhappy. But at least you've got a billion dollars. The point is that without some base level of monetary success, the studio as a unit may not have the means to sustain itself. That means no more games and no more opportunity for anyone to produce art at all. This may seem pretty simple. In fact, I can hear you saying it now. Yes, you small 200-something subscriber YouTuber person. Thanks for all the subs to everyone who's new here, by the way. It's obvious that studios need to make money, but what does that have to do with the current game development landscape? More importantly, what does that have to do with Monster Hunter? Well, kind of everything. You see, throughout history, humans have gotten really good at optimizing processes, especially processes for making money. A good example would be Henry Ford and his creation of the assembly line. He gave everyone one specialty and said, you put the wheel on the car. And if you, the employee, started to ask questions about how doors work, Ford would personally come down to the assembly floor and smack the shit out of you with a car tire. You specialized in a task. And what these specializations did was increase Ford's competitive advantage and profitability amongst car makers. The fruits of his labor is that Ford became one of the wealthiest men in history and Ford Motors is a Fortune 500 company because they found a way to save costs, increase efficiency, and thus make more profits. The concept of increasing profitability applies to the games industry as well. In the past, the games industry viewed games like a product. They sold you a cartridge once, and the goal was to keep the development costs under the selling price of the game to turn out a profit. Well, 
Like Ford got smarter about the car business, game companies got smarter about how to extend the purchasing opportunities for a game, and thus, the games as a service concept was born. With the introduction of the games as a service monetization philosophy, companies now had access to two different options when deciding how to monetize their games. The two philosophies being the traditional selling a single narrative experience for one lump sum, also known as games as a product, or periodically releasing content to players for money, or games as a service. Examples of games that follow the games as a service model would be things like Destiny, Fortnite, or Dauntless. These are games that'll sell you some kind of seasonal pass that'll give you rewards for playing the game. Other examples would be your MMO type games such as World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV which rely on a subscription in order to access the content within the games. In concept, the game companies publishing games as a service titles will be making more frequent updates to their games. These updates will usually give players more meaningful avenues to interact in the game world and also justify their routine purchasing cadence. As an example, Destiny 2 will include some form of new activity with unique weapons for players to grind out with the release of each new season. Do these new guns mean that I'm finally gonna go flawless in my trials run? No. But it does at least provide the necessary copium to keep trying with my new slick loadout. God damn it, I'm so bad at these games. Good thing this is a Monster Hunter video. Contrast games following the games as a service model with games that follow the games as a product model. Games like, well, Monster Hunter. See? You probably thought I forgot that this was a Monster Hunter video, but don't worry, we're getting there. Games like Monster Hunter, Dark Souls, Hollow Knight, Mario Odyssey, these are all games that were sold as one product. The company will realize the majority of their revenue in the initial sale. These games are released with a defined endpoint, usually because they're focused on a traditional narrative structure with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And to you, the smug fuck sliding their glasses up their nose right now about to say, well actually, DLC for some of those examples you gave are released later on, so not all the content is released at one point, and the company will get their money later down the line when they make the additional sale of DLC content. Doesn't that make your point invalid, Mr. YouTube Man? <sighs> Why don't you do me a favor? and go outside and touch some grass for a second. Because if you look at these DLC releases, like Sunbreak for Monster Hunter, Iceborne for Monster Hunter, like the Ring City for Dark Souls 3, like the Old Hunters for Bloodborne, like the Blood and Wine DLC for The Witcher 3, these are all released under the same conceptual models as their base game. They're not an extension of a service, but a self-contained narrative experience with a defined endpoint. What I'm trying to say is, these companies are just selling you a brand new game. Now, you've probably noticed that I haven't brought up the forbidden third monetization technique. Microtransactions. If you're older than the generation that participated in D-Day, then there's a good chance that you have at some point run into a cash shop, a gym store, or some similar transaction stall inside your game. These shops are in games that are sold as products as well as games that are sold as a service. Usually, the stores sell cosmetic items, which don't intrinsically provide any tangible edge inside of the game itself. They're just a status symbol, so you can go and Fortnite on whoever you just killed while you tell your friends about how you banged their mom or something. Let me be clear, I'm all for people paying for good looking art. The art team at Riot deserves to be paid for how cool some of these League skins are. However, some companies started to play with the idea of selling tangible advantages inside of their microtransaction store. When somebody can pay for a tangible advantage, that is my proverbial line in the sand. Thus enters the term pay to win. By providing a purchasable advantage within a game store, companies create an unlevel playing field for their player base. There is an advantaged class of player and a disadvantaged class of player. A good example of pay to win concepts is within Black Desert Online where you can pay to accelerate your weapon and armor upgrade process. Or perhaps an even better example would be the new Star Wars Battlefield game where weapon upgrades and equipment were gated behind cards which were purchasable via loot boxes. So. Let's have a talk. A mod to you guys. Some people don't like it when YouTubers get loud in their videos. And here's your warning. The topic that I'm about to talk about really frustrates me. 
and I'm about to tell a story where I'm gonna get very loud. The warning's over. Let's talk about Shadows of War. And I know that's not a Monster Hunter game, but... In 2017, a cute little single player game was released called Shadows of War, published by a cute small indie company called Warner Brothers. You probably haven't heard of them. Shadows of War is actually a lot of fun to play. The short summary is it's a Batman Arkham game, but Lord of the Rings, so you can expect fast-paced action combat with counters and 1v100 arenas. They also have a system where you build your own orc army by overthrowing the current orc hierarchy, and you can deploy your orcs to break shit all across Mordor. Now, Pin this game mechanic because it's the crux of what actually makes me so mad. As I mentioned previously, this is a single player, narratively driven action game. And like a lot of similar single player experiences, there were secret endings unlocked by performing certain activities. This game was no different. In Shadows of War, you needed to complete 20 sieges, which had 10 stages respectively, where you would pit your orc armies against an invading orc force. And these enemy orcs were tough. To get your orcs to an equivalent level would be hours of mindless grinding in the narratively driven action RPG, where all I wanna do is just kill bad guys and experience the story, or you could go straight to the cash shop and just buy loot boxes until you had a god tier army of unstoppable super orcs. Now, it is my duty to inform you that Warner Bros released an update removing the store from the game in 2022, which is definitely a step in the right direction. And prior to this update, you were in fact able to grind for hours and hours to upgrade your orcs to be strong enough to take on these opposing forces. And for some people, the option to grind for the end game content is enough. But to me, it kind of feels incredibly disrespectful that my options are hours of painstakingly dull grinding or to pay money to see the ending of a narratively driven action game. It doesn't feel like there's actually any option in there at all. It feels like the options are don't have fun grinding for something stupid or pay me $100 to see the actual end of the game. That's like if someone cut the last 30 pages out of a book and then told you in order to get the last 30 pages, you need to write your own 30 page ending that will go through the entire publisher review process and then once it is publisher reviewed we will then give you the last 30 pages or we can just sell you the last 30 pages in the deluxe package i can see it now the advertising for this bullshit would be the novel now with all the pages. I just want to know who the sick bastard was who thought so little of our time as players that he thought it would be okay to monetize the conclusion of a narratively focused game. <laughs> God damn. Okay, calm down, recenter. Nope, I'm not done. It's also becoming more apparent than ever that some companies are just trying different avenues to offensively over-monetize games. I mean, let's look at this year's current punching bag, Diablo Immortal. In Diablo Immortal, you can literally pay for items to increase the likelihood of getting the best gems, which exponentially increase your capacity to kill demons. Again, Yes, you can technically get everything by playing for free, but the chance of actually getting a good gem for your character are so astronomically low that people would be better off buying lottery tickets on the hopes of becoming rich and then paying for a maxed out Diablo Immortal character instead of actually playing the game. This is one component of the things that are monetized in a predatory manner. Almost every aspect of this game is designed to get you inside of the store and spend your money. At least I don't have to pay to change my name though. That would be absolute. What's that on the store? <laughs> What's even worse is that Blizzard also added PvP so that you can absolutely get crushed by some fucking Giga Whale. Blizzard's gotta make sure that the fucking pores know that this absolute apex predator over here is better than them because he got good at entering his credit card information. It makes no sense to me why this kind of predatory monetization is in any game at all. It also makes no sense to me why anyone is fucking paying for it. And I know some of you are, because if microtransactions weren't making any money for games companies, they'd stop putting so much effort into making microtransactions in the first place. 
So, some of you are probably thinking, okay, I get it, Ahmad. Microtransactions are bad, but what does this have to do with Monster Hunter? You said this was going to be a Monster Hunter video, and I've gotta say, I appreciate your patience here, but trust me, all of this has a point. You see, I'm trying to paint a picture of how bad some game monetization models are so that we can appreciate what the good games like Monster Hunter, are doing. In fact, I think it's time that we start talking about the antithesis of the scummy games I've been talking about up to now. Monster Hunter, God of War, Dark Souls, The Last of Us, The Witcher 3. These games sell you a game, and it is complete. When you buy a Monster Hunter game or a Souls game, you are going to get the complete set of encounters and narrative. Nothing is gated behind an additional payment. There are no loot boxes. There's no service fee. It's just finished. Is that to say there is no incremental monetization at all? No, of course not. Some of these games do have cosmetic purchases like Monster Hunter. You can buy hairstyles and voice packs, but they aren't selling you the fucking atomic uwu voice pack that instantly kills everything for you. No, I have to put my big boy pants on and kill Scorn Magnamalo by myself, just like everyone else. Then there are the DLC releases, which are substantial expansions upon the narrative and gameplay of these games. My go-to example here is the Blood and Wine expansion for The Witcher 3, where they release an additional 100 hours of content for about 20 bucks. Or even more recently, the Monster Hunter Sunbreak expansion, where I am still currently racking up hundreds plural of hours killing monsters and having fun. And yeah, it was $40, but it's well worth all $40, and that's the point. Games in this category aren't trying to scam you out of your money, they're just trying to make a good game. They want you to have fun and keep playing their game and associate their brand with fun and complete entertainment. Okay, so now you see how Monster Hunter is on the right side of history. Finally, he's gonna start talking about a Monster Hunter game! Monster Hunter is selling us a complete experience along with a bunch of other companies who also make quality video games. But there is more to Monster Hunter that makes it stand out as a great game that will always get my money. Now, before I dive into Monster Hunter, I need to preface this discussion because we're like flirting in a lot of different fandoms here, and I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes. This next segment is not intended to compare any other game to Monster Hunter. It is just a list of subjective values that drive me to feel confident that a full price purchase of a Monster Hunter game is a good decision. While I'm listing all of these topics out, I'd love for you guys to think of games that you think also have competitive advantages in the market and drop those down in the comments. Maybe hit the like and subscribe if you've been enjoying the video so far. And also, if you feel like I'm personally attacking you in your favorite game series, I don't know. Don't. Is that an option? Is don't an option? Fuck it. Let's go. The competitive advantage of Monster Hunter is in the sheer quantity of content Capcom will pack into one of these games. I know people who have thousands of hours in Monster Hunter, and that's because Capcom packs so much stuff, not just into the narrative progression, but also into the in-game progression of the game. The presence of an in-game intrinsically makes the game more replayable than other games. For example, take The Last of Us. It's not a secret that the game is a really good game, right? But what happens once you beat the story? You're kind of done, right? In Monster Hunter, you literally are just getting started. In Monster Hunter, you can start grinding weapon sets for every weapon. You can start putting together your in-game armor. You've just unlocked the best part of the game. But before I get ahead of myself, I think we need to address the real elephant in the room. What if Capcom is just putting out a lot of bad content? Which is a fair question, especially if you've never played one of these games before. I mean, infinite bad content is way worse than a finite amount of good content, so let's walk through Monster Hunter and lay out how not only is this a lot of content, but it's a lot of good content. Monster Hunter has a very simple gameplay loop. You are a hunter, and you fight monsters. When you fight the monsters and you kill them, you collect their materials, and then you go and make armor and weapons from said materials. This means that every fight that you take is directly connected to your character progression. As you make better weapons and armor, you also unlock the ability to challenge even stronger monsters. This is a gameplay loop that incentivizes the player to just continuously play the game. But 
Rewards mean nothing if the gameplay isn't fun, right? Well, I'm not gonna mince words here. Monster Hunter's gameplay is fantastic. You get to pick one of 14 different weapons, each with its own set of moves, and they all fucking slap. The weapon design philosophy is centered around what I call a dopamine moment. When you execute an attack that is classified as a dopamine moment, you will feel rewarded based on how much damage it does or how cool it looks or oftentimes both. When these attacks land, your brain excretes the good chemical everywhere. And for a brief moment, you don't think you need your therapist anymore. Until you die to the Izuchi, then, then you remember how trash you are at this game. An example of a dopamine moment within the game would be the true charge slash for the Greatsword. The Greatsword is a big weapon that charges its attacks to do big damage. There are three phases to charging, and three levels of chargedness per phase, which are represented by the pulsing glows around the sword. At the final phase, the great sword will do what's called a true charge slash, where the hunter will do a 360 degree cartwheel, followed by an overhead slam with the great sword. How fucking cool is that? Just tossing hundreds of pounds of steel or bone over your shoulder and laying down the fucking dicking of the century on some poor reptile. I mean, Look at what happens when this animation actually connects with the monster. Every weapon has a cool moment like this too, something that makes you feel like a god among men doing crazy amounts of damage, and the fact that you often have to meet some certain requirement to actually get the opportunity to try and land this attack makes it feel even more rewarding, like you have some kind of player skill involved with the ability to execute these moves. Now. Take this really engaging combat system and marry it up with how tough these monster fights are. I mean, you haven't known fear until you've missed time to counter and now you're about to get slapped by a Zenogre for countering too early in its Tatsu combo. That is to say, you can't just go full unga bunga, full gorilla offense all the time. These fights require you to know both the offensive and defensive flow between you and the creature you are fighting. As you first beat these fights, you're going to get the feeling of success similar to beating a Soulsborne boss. But then, as you re-hunt these monsters to make more armor and weapons, you'll gain mastery over their movesets. This mastery enables you to execute more dopamine moments, meaning that the more you hunt a monster, often Oftentimes, the more fun you will experience just due to how fast paced the combat is. The combat in these games are a masterclass in action RPG gameplay design. It has a simple loop that ensures that players are always progressing towards something while also creating engaging moment to moment combat. This means that players are going to be rewarded in both the short term via the combat and the long term via the weapon and armor goal completion. What I'm saying is that Monster Hunter's gameplay is really good. And like I said before, there's a lot of it, but it doesn't stop there. Capcom releases title updates periodically for these games. These title updates usually include several new monsters and event quests. Now, if we think about other games as a service games, they usually monetize periodic game updates, right? That's how they make money after all. Well, guess what? Monster Hunter, they release these updates all for free. That's right. You're using my cold capitalist safe word for free. These updates often bring in new weapons, armors, and skills for you to spend time creating. Oftentimes, the armor is tied to new hard as fuck monsters who are spectacles to behold in their own right. Sunbreak actually just released their first title update where they introduced four new monsters, each with their own armor and weapons. On top of that, they introduced a brand new in-game crafting system to ensure that your character can keep progressing throughout the end game. Throughout the game's life cycle, Monster Hunter will also introduce new event quests for players to partake in, which can reward weapons, crafting materials, or cosmetic armor. Cosmetics! You know, the thing that most companies will sell on their store. They'll allow players to earn those for free in their game. They are actively trying to make sure that players don't have to buy incremental transactions if they don't want to. Some of these event quests are also just really fun nods to Capcom's other IPs like Street Fighter or Okami, or sometimes they've even crossed over with other games like Final Fantasy. So. To recap, Monster Hunter has the following. Fun base gameplay, a complete experience without any incremental purchase, a massive quantity of content to play through, and continuous substantial updates for free 
to make sure that you can always keep progressing and having fun fighting monsters. Capcom has taken the best parts of both the games as a product model and the games as a service model and bundled them together to make sure that the players are first. Who would have thought valuing your customers would have been a good market strategy? By putting players first, it tells me that Capcom as a company believes that respecting their players' time and producing a quality game is the most critical element to earn money from its customers. In accounting, there's this concept of goodwill. And I know what you're thinking. Really? You're going to start talking about accounting and business again? We were just talking about dinosaurs. Yeah, but this is my video, so we're going to talk about things I want to talk about, okay? There's this concept of goodwill. Will. Goodwill is an intangible asset. You, you can't hold it, but it's the monetary representation of the value of a company's brand. By giving so much to the player, Capcom is building up huge amounts of goodwill. That means their brand is worth trusting and worth buying immediately because we, the player base, knows that when they put a Monster Hunter game out, it's going to be a high quality experience. Thank you, Capcom, for being a diamond in the middle of a giant pile of shit that is the modern games industry. But what do you guys think? What's the reason you'll always buy a Monster Hunter game? And are there other companies that do just as good a job as Capcom? If you've got any ideas, Drop them down in the comments and maybe drop a like and subscribe. It'll help out with the algorithm. Thanks again for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.